brothers, sisters, friends, enemies, and neutrals, I'm back. And today I'm going to deal with some matters of a legislative nature. I'm going to start out with a transcript from early in my career. It doesn't have a date, but it was in the early 70s. And every word spoken on the floor of the legislature is recorded. And there are people known as the transcribers who type up every word. One of the problems is that some of the women who did this, they were all women in those days, they didn't have the best of education. So if there was a word and they weren't sure what it was, they would approximate it. And as a result, make the speaker sound like he or she was poorly educated because the word that they used did not fit if it was a word at all. An example, if you take the word principle, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E, the word stands for a concept, an idea, or something along that line. If it ends with the P-A-L, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L, it refers to a person who is like the principal of the school or the main element, the main ingredient. Well, if you mean it as a principal in the sense of a concept and they give it, they spell it as though it's the main ingredient, it seems that you as the speaker don't have much facility in the use of language. If they cannot think of a word to approximate what they thought they heard, then they put parentheses and write the word in those parentheses inaudible, which means that you spoke in a way that couldn't be understood rather than acknowledging that they didn't know how to spell. But anyway, I'm gonna read from this transcript. It's early on and people were still trying to figure out what kind of person I was. They were in awe when they found out that I got brain cells working that I can put 10 words or more together and make sense. I was the kind of black man they had never been exposed to. I was young at the time. When I wore a younger man's clothes, but they happen to be the same style, if you want to call it that, that I wear now. So this deals with a piece of legislation that the farm or rural senators wanted, which would allow school board members to have contracts with the school district that their board was in charge of. I viewed that always as a conflict of interest because it would give them a leg up, a head start over anybody else who might be able to do the same kind of work in the private sector. And since the people on the school board would lay out the plans and everything that was going to be done, they could get in on the ground floor and that is where I saw the conflict of interest. You were writing the contract that would benefit you as a public official and had entree to information that others did not. So when that bill was first brought, there are several school districts in Nebraska and the number has varied. And the number is assigned based on the number of students in that school. For example, Omaha is District 5, because it is the largest in the state. Lincoln's number would be four. Then you go downward from there. I was against this bill. And when these kind of things came up, it gave me the opportunity to go beyond what they were talking about in the bill to talk about what they are as a society and what they are and are not as human beings and especially as elected officials. When an I say president to designate who is presiding, it can be different people. The constitution makes the lieutenant governor the official presiding officer over the legislature to give that person something to do, I imagine. When that person is not available, then it usually falls to the speaker of the legislature to determine who will preside. The speaker often will take that position, but sometimes he will assign it to somebody else. And anybody who is assigned to sit in that chair as the speaker is addressed as Mr. Speaker or 
Mr. President or Madam Speaker, Madam President. So here we go. President, motion is to advance LB 550. Senator Chambers, do you wish to be recognized? Mr. President, members of the legislature, I occupy a unique position in this legislature. And by the way, these people are still trying to get a fix on the kind of man I am, was in those days. I occupy a unique position in this legislature, not only as the only black member, but one of the few men who has to be conscious at all times of the welfare of poor people, those who have no voice, and those who are generally unrepresented in this body and all governing bodies throughout this country. I have this great bitterness because of the problems that were to be dealt with by this legislation that I had offered, but they were not touched at all. The one deals with corporal punishment inflicted on students in the schools. This legislature was very unsympathetic to these young people who have this problem to face. Corporal punishment is when they use these paddles and it was in black schools only against these children. The problem they face, they are in a learning situation and that learning situation is totally destroyed by the constant threat of physical punishment inflicted by the teacher who is supposed to be teaching them to solve problems through intellectual processes or the principal or assistant principal. They would not do anything about getting rid of corporal punishment at that time. Ultimately, I did get rid of it. Then we come to district elections for school board members so that the people who are unrepresented and have no voice in school affairs could have a chance to put somebody of their choosing on the school boards and to make this these kind of decisions. Again, the legislature was totally unsympathetic. I gave the argument that every governing body should be a portraiture in miniature of the constituency to be governed. Therefore, every segment ought to have a representative. When the voting was at large, then whoever comprised the majority would vote on all of the members and they could outvote any individual group. And therefore the board always represented the powerful, the well-born and so forth as people have come to realize, continuing. This morning, I see a bill that deals with the financial interest, and I feel it is a conflict of interest of school officials and the body, meaning the legislature, jumps to heel immediately. There's great concern about the welfare financially about these people who are running the schools, which I feel is improper. All I have is one vote. I can't stop the passage of these votes. I can't vote the passage of the ones that I'm interested in with my one vote. I am casting my vote to show my opposition in the only way I have available to me in a meaningful way. But I developed a technique that's later. Other than that, each one of us is given 10 minutes to speak on an issue. And I can use my voice to give the rationale as to why I vote against these measures, why I am for the ones that I advocate. I think that this is bad legislation. It is pernicious. And I think that it flies in the teeth of the ideals and principles which a legislative body like this one is supposed to embody. We talk about conflict of interest against each other when State Senator Proud, for example, who makes his living through insurance, would introduce a bill relating to insurance companies or the industry as a whole, that was called a conflict of interest for him. Or if somebody, when not in the legislature, was a feeder and offered a bill, feeder of livestock, that was considered a conflict of interest for the senator or a cattle grower 
or the farmers or the petroleum interest or the cigarette interest. All of these would be considered to create a conflict if the senator offering the legislation had any connection with them. But when it came to the schools, they wanted the school board members to be allowed to have financial contracts with the school district of which they were a board member. Yet in an area that touches everybody very, very closely, the education of their children, there is the same concern generally, but it does not exist in the legislature. I've seen lobbyists who did a good job for the school system last year get jobs with the school people afterward so they were well paid for the vicious things that they did as lobbyists. I'm being put in a position more and more where my back is coming closer and closer to the wall. It is difficult for me to function in a body like this according to the rules we have established. It is not necessary for anybody in this group to consider using what they consider an unauthorized or unacceptable means to bring about social change, namely violence, because you have enough votes to do whatever you want to do. Whether it is to change a school law or to grind an entire group of people into the dirt like you're doing and will do on the welfare legislation for poor people, you will do that. But I sit here and I learn the lessons that you are teaching me. I carry them back to the community I come from and I think there will be a day of reckoning. You men, I wish, and there were no women in the legislature when I first went there. You men, I wish, would realize and recognize the position that you keep me in. I don't believe many of you could go to an assembly of all black people or all poor people or groups that feel that this body is hostile to their interests and do as well in that assembly as I do in this one as the only black person. I come down here, I try to use your language so you'll understand. I'll try to follow your rules that you put in place and abide by them more strictly than you do. I try to read and understand your laws that you write and some of them make no sense. I try to use your procedures to change your laws and when it doesn't work and changes must occur, what alternatives are left. So I'm going to vote against this bill. I'm going to make a stupid statement now because you ought to use the language the people understand to whom you're addressing yourself. I'm going to say that I recommend that this bill be defeated, that it not be advanced. I'm not going to put a kill motion on it. That would be an exercise in futility. But I have taken my position. I've explained to you to the best of my ability why I've taken this position. You can do with it now what you will. If I could see the same concern shown to the students in school that I see shown to the welfare and financial interests of school officials, then maybe I could concede something on a bill like this. But when you are totally hard-hearted like a, and the type is put inaudible and the word is flint, when you're totally hard-hearted like a flint, then you pass bills relating to the schools when it comes to formulas for state aid but you're not interested in an improvement of the curriculum. You won't visit the classrooms to find out what the students are actually being taught or not being taught. I have to be greatly concerned about the interest this body really has in legitimate education. I hope that you will consider what I've said and vote not to advance this bill. Thank you. President, Senator Whitney, Senator Whitney, Mr. President, I want to speak in favor of advancing this bill. Before I do so, I want to compliment Senator Chambers on the TV last night. He did a marvelous job. And that's all I read of what he said. I don't even remember what was being discussed by me on television. Maybe it was this bill. President recognizes Senator Carstens. Senator Carson speaks. I think that somebody 
ought to make some answer to what Senator Chambers said, because I do not believe that he understands the purpose and the need for this type of legislation. I have in my district a small village, a small town, where the school board members are the people who are interested in schools and education, and they're engaged in business of one type or another, sometimes in several businesses. They may have a lumber yard, a general store, or they may have some type of automobile business or some kind of gasoline fuel or something of that nature. Now, these people cannot serve on the school board because by doing so, they are then completely barred from having any inaudible relationship with the school district. The result is that they do not serve on the school board. The next result is that the services, I'm gonna read these words just as they're typed. The next, result, re, the next result is that the services in many of these smaller communities is the best people most able to serve and most willing to serve and who can contribute the most to it are barred because in order to do so, they are compelled to suffer financial sacrifices beyond which could be justified. The purpose of this bill was to correct this. There is no hidden meaning in this legislation, and I know the problem that Senator Chambers complains about, and I certainly have supported him in many of his problems, supported me in my problems. They caused my problems. Continuing. I have supported him in many of his problems over the past year at the expense of incurring the wrath of other members of the legislature on legislation that I was interested in. And I've also done it sometimes against what I felt was possibly my best judgment. I do not believe that his efforts, in his efforts, he has suffered any more disappointments of defeats in this legislature than I have. I have certainly not been successful. I worked three or four years on trying to reform the juvenile crime problem and juvenile detention problem, and it was tossed down the drain But while Senator Chambers was in this legislature. I did not hear him utter one word in support of my effort. That is what you call an FIB, a fib. I spent three years of long, and I mean I spent time on it at my own expense, month after month. I put in considerable effort, this is Senator Carstens, an older farmer, and I had no assistance on this score, although what it was trying to do affected the people Chambers is most interested in. I do not think I get a kind of tired of this business that we're in a sort of a zombie world where people of one color or one race have one standard and people of another color or another race have another standard. I do not look at it like that. I'm less of a racist than some of the black people that I come in contact with every day. Now, what black person does he come in contact with who can refuse him a job because he's, a, he's white, refuse to rent him a house because he's white, refuse to sell him a house because he's white, will refuse to allow him to come into an eating establishment because he's white. This is the simple mindedness of these white people that I was dealing with alone. And I'm glad that it was transcribed so that people can see I'm not making it up when I talk about the stupidity that I had to deal with. And there is a philosopher who said, even the gods labor in vain against stupidity. Here he continues, I'm in a sense in the minority too. I know just about as much about being discriminated against the Senator Chambers than Sen as Senator Chambers does because this is all I have known all my life. A white man who's in the legislature and got his business has known discrimination all his life and he always lived among white people. It is continuing even to this day, he said. There are some things that we have to do and recognize if we cannot trust each other in everything, we had better just disband and submit ourselves to a dictatorship because in the democratic government, we have to treat each other sometime in some place a little bit in good faith. And we have to accept each other in good faith. And there are black racists just as well as there are white racists. 
we have these problems and we have them in these small communities and we have difficulties in small communities. This is why they disintegrate because you cannot get qualified people to take part in the necessary function that keep a community together. Now he's telling the truth on his people. I'm sure that they exist in Omaha in the same manner and people get so to the point that only the less qualified or the least qualified or the unqualified or the poorest qualified are eligible. This is what we are trying to get away from in this area. I think that myself, that the $10,000 figure at the present time is too high. And I would offer an amendment that I would move that this $10,000 be stricken and $5,000 be inserted. President, Senator Carstens has moved that the $10,000 be stricken and that be changed to $5,000. Now that is the motion under discussion. Let me see. Senator Morgan, Mr. President, members of this body, and this is PJ Morgan, by the way, the real estate man, he was in that when he was in the legislature, he and I work together on a lot of issues. Mr. President, members of this body, I agree with Senator Chambers and possibly what we could do and what I would like to ask of Senator Zebarth if he would yield to a question. Senator B Zebarth, I yield. Senator Morgan, I'm not sure that amending it. Now, I'm a member of the Urban Affairs Committee, which put the bill out, and I heard the reasons which you gave were good reasons why the bill should be advanced. And I hate to see us cut it down when some of these communities need to have contracts and in excess of $5,000. Why couldn't we lay the bill over and amend out the larger districts and include the smaller ones where the problem is existing right now? Senator Zebar. Well, Senator Morgan, I think no doubt that the class four, which is Lincoln, and five, which is Omaha, which includes only one city in each, cities of Lincoln and Omaha, be amended out because I've heard no reason for them to be in. No one from those districts has contacted me. And these are the prime reasons Senator Chambers brings out in areas where this is not needed. I agree that it would not be needed in the Omaha and Lincoln areas. I would be willing to amend the bill for the class one, two, and six districts, and I would like to keep the $10,000 in Senator Carson's, keep that in Senator Carson's, mainly because of the school buses in some of these districts. If we amend out the class four and five districts of Omaha and Lincoln, would that be acceptable to you, Senator Carson's? I withdraw my motion if you want to limit the classes. President, go ahead, okay. Senator Zebar. If it is okay with you now, Senator, Senator Zebarth has withdrawn his motion and that is no longer discussion. Now, what is your pleasure? Senator Zebarth, Vince, that's the clerk. On the original bill on page two, line four, after no school officer, insert of class one, three, and six districts. That would be the amendment. Vince of class four, and five districts instead of one, three, and six. So I move for the adoption of this amendment. President, Senator Chambers asked to be recognized. Now I read word for word what they said and you heard it. Repetition, Mr. President, members of the legislature, repetition seems to be an essential part of the debate in this body. I'm not repeating myself as much as some of the other gentlemen on the floor have done time after time after time. So in spite of how tired some may get of hearing me say what I have to say, I'm going to say it anytime I see the need. And as far as, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Carstens is gone. I voted on behalf of a bill of his on that juvenile situation, contrary to a lawyer who was trying to unify the entire area of corrections. <clears throat> Excuse me. My vote in behalf of Senator Carson's bill caused my intentions to be questioned by people I was working with. I say this for a reason. There are a lot of times that people want to sit around here and talk about all that they have done for me. 
they have done they have not done anything for me i have not done anything for anybody not for anybody in this body when i vote a certain way it's because i believe in the principle of the bill or it's a bill which is indifferent as far as i'm concerned it won't cause any harm to anybody so by voting for its passage i'm not going against the interest that i represent but every time something comes up that relates to the welfare of black people poor people i'll speak and i'll be heard by anybody who is in the chamber even if the president would tell somebody to cut off my microphone i would find another way to be heard and the way i've seen men stand up on this floor and talk about irrelevancies nonsensical things nonsensical from where i sit i don't see how anybody can criticize anything that i say at least my sentences are complete at least my thoughts are, co are coherent i try to use the logic that i think would be grasped by this body to make them understand what i'm trying to say and this is what communication consists of i'm here to challenge <clears throat> excuse me and i'm here to question <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I was sent here, not w through sufferance of this body, but I was elected by people who didn't care what this body thought about my being here. The former governor was opposed to my election. His lieutenant governor served as the chairman of the con and contribution committee for my opponent. The World Herald endorsed my opponent and editorialized against me. The black preachers officially spoke against me. Senators from this body donated money to the campaign of my opponent. And there are men who are sitting in this body right now who gave an ovation to a black man who stood on this floor and said that God put the white man in command and there is nothing that can be done about it. I don't forget these things. Some of these men, most of them, are in this body right now. And you ask me to forget it? I'm sure Sam Claver, he, he was there then, couldn't forget it as a Jewish person if somebody stood up here and praised Adolf Eichmann or said that God intended all the Jews to be wiped out in a furnace and let his will be done. Jewish Senator Claver would not have sat still for that. There is everybody in this body who has some interest they are not going to allow to be trampled if he is a man. But if he is going to be intimidated and cowered down, oh, thank you. Let me continue. There are people looking out for me when I don't even realize it. So I think since the water was brought, I will drink it. And some people say a blessed a verse before they eat. Well, I sing for water. All day I face the barren waste without the taste of water. Cool, clear water. Keep a moving, Dan. Don't you listen to him, Dan. He's a devil, not a man. And he spreads the burning sand with water. Now I'm going to spare you all that. Get back to reading this transcript. And every time I read this stuff, I get infuriated all over again. White people like to portray themselves as the master race. They don't even speak their own language well. They don't speak as though they have any education, yet they enact laws about education. They pass laws that establish curriculum, the things that should be done by people who themselves are educated, but white people are not required to meet the standards they set and say we ought to meet. In other words, they want us to be wiser than our teachers, and in most cases we are. They get by by simply being white, and no matter what we learn, no matter what we've achieved, there's going to be that barrier there. Continuing, everybody in this body has some interest 
they are not going to allow to be trampled if that somebody is a man. But if he is going to be intimidated and cowed down by somebody wrinkling his brow or raising his voice or saying, I'll vote against the bill of yours, then he shouldn't be in this body. But we know that legislative assemblies are not made up of moral men who feel responsibilities to the people they represent or who feel accountable to the community from which they came. The lobbyists control this legislature and like the Bible said, where the carcass is, there will the buzzards be gathered together. We may be the carcass. Now, if a man thinks I'm calling him a buzzard and I haven't called his name and said he is a buzzard, a guilty conscience needs no accuser. But on this bill, back to the specific issue, if the amendment is going to be put on, on select file, which would exclude Omaha and Lincoln from its operations, then although in principle, I don't agree with the idea of having school members having contracts with the school boards that they're members of, or any other official to have contracts with the board of which he or she is a member, I would not then oppose passage of this bill. I want you all to take note of that. This is as much of a compromise as I can offer. I know that my one vote can't make that much difference on this bill, but there may come another day when it will be very significant because a man may have 24 votes and may need a 25th vote, which rests with me. President, I remind the body that the question under discussion at this time is the advancement of LB 550 from General 5. Now, let me read an update. This is something from 1999. Chambers, Hourglass, Make Mark. This was in the Lincoln Journal Star, May 19th, Malcolm X's birthday, 1999. The printing is much smaller. Ernie Chambers comes to the floor of the legislature armed, brandishing his weapon. It is an oversized hourglass and with it threatens to take his 48 colleagues captive and place the legislature under siege. Remember, that was back then that I read, I established my credentials, what I was able to do and what I would do if challenged. You're gonna hear something about it in this article from 1991. Tie it up, bring it screeching to a halt, shut this legislature down, with time running out, important bills waiting, only nine days to go. Chambers is singing. As the days dwindle down to a precious few, he intones as he leans into the microphone. The sand is slowly sifting through the hourglass. The clock is ticking. A precious day is melting away. Chambers has seized Omaha's convention center bill by the throat. He has prepared dozens of amendments, which he presents one by one, explaining each in detail, bringing other senators into the debate by asking them questions, luring others in by what he has to say. The F word has arrived on the floor of the legislature, says John Bruning, 30-year-old Sarpy County senator who later became attorney general. It is not a polite word you utter in a room full of senators, but heck, this is a family newspaper, so we can say it, filibuster. The sanitized version is extended debate. When Chambers chooses, when Chambers chooses, he can shackle the legislature to a single bill with eight hours of debate, 24 hours altogether under the rules. If he does that at each of three stages of floor consideration, and of course, he can do it on more than one bill. It is his ultimate weapon. Chambers has an arsenal at his disposal, intellect, oratorical skills, preparation, focus, determination, knowledge of the rules and human nature, a quickness of mind that usually keeps him a step or two ahead of the pack, a capacity for instant maneuver. Lots of options before he goes nuclear. 
He tried to reach accord with sponsors of the convention center legislation. I bent over backwards like I have never done, he said, but there was no accommodation, he stated. Quote, fine, we'll have it my way. Brothers and sisters, get ready for the ride. We need to play hardball now, unquote. Chambers said he's aware that some of his colleagues don't think he can go eight hours anymore now that he is approaching 62. Oh, to be a young 62 again. Wrong, he says, they can't. As others wear out, I'm into my territory. Chambers was in his fifth hour of debating before he got his way. Another victory. Advocates of the measure with a mighty assist from Lincoln's Dave Landis, raised the bar for Omaha voter approval of the bonds to construct the $210 million facility. I wanted a supermajority to vote. This will explain why. A supermajority of more than 51% of the voters would be required. The issue would have to be submitted to the larger pool of voters in a state primary or general election rather than to the smaller turnout in a special election or even a regularly scheduled city election. I learned all about all branches, all levels of government in this state, city, county, and state. When I'm dealing with something, I learn the rules. If they're hostile, I learn their rules and beat them at their own game using their rules, continuing. Those are very significant changes. Omaha's $254 million school bond issue was approved earlier this month by 51.5% of the votes and a light 25% turnout. A $210 million bond issue on top of that may be a hard sell in a much larger voter pool next May. Chambers argues that the city's funding commitment to the convention center project would hurt his constituents in perpetuity by denying city funding to projects that would benefit citizens and neighborhoods that have been left behind, black people and poor white people. In his 29th year of the legislature, Chambers is a unique force. True to himself, he is who he was when he first arrived in 1971, warrior made of iron. The young African-American firebrand whose arrival sent chills down many a legislative spine has outlasted all of them and is now dean of the legislature. If he had served in the California legislature or done his thing in New York City or Chicago, he would be a national figure today. Now, let's go up a little farther. This is April 2006, and it is in a Washington, D.C., news outlet called Roll Call Politics. Headline, Dateline, Washington, D.C. Headline, One Nebraskan's Gadfly is Another Man's Hero. Term limits forcing out Nebraska's most controversial senator. And I'm bringing it close because the printing is very small. For those of a certain age, it's hard to believe it's been so long. But today is the 30th anniversary of the assassination of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Along with all the tributes that have flowed King's way through the years, there is always speculation about what the United States and the world would have been like if he had lived. Occasionally, people wonder what he would have thought of the state of modern politics. Less often, there's speculation about whether King, like his protege Jesse Jackson, Andrew Young and John Lewis would have decided at some point to get in electoral politics. They wondered. It's easy to imagine that he would have gone far given his smarts and oratorical gifts. Eight years after King's death, his father, the Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., AKA Daddy King, gave a stirring speech on Jimmy Carter's behalf as he delivered the closing prayer at the 1976 Democratic National Convention, these Negro preachers knew how to politic in the guise of a prayer. Just two years after King died, Ernie Chambers was elected to the Nebraska Senate representing a poor, largely minority section of Omaha. The first and only, that's incorrect, 
there had been two before me, three actually. The first and only black member of, I was the only black one at that time, the first and only black member of the state's unique unicameral and nonpartisan legislature. One of the first things he did in office was to try to win some kind of official state recognition and honor for King. But Chambers' career also is about to be cut short, not by an assassin's bullet, but by term limits referendum that passed in 2001. Although 20 of the legislature's 49 senators will be forced out of office at the end of 2008, Make no mistake, the push to in, uh, institute term limits was largely focused on chambers. They would change their entire constitution, the entire mode of government to get rid of one black man because it was too powerful under their rules. He recalled in an interview Monday that the people carrying the petition to get the measure on the ballot used his name as their main argument to win support. Quote, some people from outside the state paid circulators of petitions. There was a national outfit called Term Limits USA. Circulate, and they gave them a little card saying that the only way they can get Chambers out of office is by changing the Constitution so that he can not run anymore. Chambers said, next. Then the same argument was used to persuade people to vote for the provision. And that's why it carried. Without a doubt, Chambers' tactics and rhetoric sometimes rub people the wrong way. Listen to him discuss race relations and the way they affect American politics as an instance. Quote, our situation is different from white people because white representatives, whether on the same, the state level or the national level, are more or less interchangeable. The interests of white people throughout the state or country overlap or intersect. So even if they don't get their specific choice, the voters will still have their issue heard because everybody's white. However, when it comes to black people, we need somebody who is strong, tenacious, intelligent, and fearless. When we get such a person totally incorruptible, that person will keep our issue before the public and make some incremental changes. This is what I've been doing and it's created a lot of resentment. I will continue this the next time because the clock is a very harsh taskmaster and even I must bow to it. But before I do, I want to read the title of an article that appeared in Omaha Magazine in 2015, that damn Ernie Chambers, exclamation part, he's point, he's self-absorbed, self-righteous, and infuriating, and he's absolutely necessary. As the canary said, when told that the cage door was ajar, I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers Show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.